Hello friends, welcome to this new season of The Buzz. We're gonna start off by asking a pretty important question. How do animals survive all winter long? Learn who stays active, sleeps, and migrates. Plus, we'll share the story of a snowy owl, and maybe you'll be lucky to see one this winter. Get ready to bundle up and get active on this episode of The Buzz. We're in the middle of winter, and you may have noticed a difference in animal activity. Some animals are still around, while others are harder to find. And one of the questions I get asked is how do these animals survive the bitter temperatures? Well, some stay active, some sleep, and some migrate. So let's break down each group and discover which animal is using which strategy. Animals that are active during the winter keep to their daily schedules and go to sleep at their usual time but they have to keep on the move to search for food to survive. To make the elements a little bit easier, they can adapt their fur and sometimes their diet. Animals that stay active, the deer, coyotes, mice, beaver, and a handful of birds. First, active animals have to switch over to their winter coats. They can't add on a heavier sweater like we can, but instead they grow thicker fur. Animals like deer and coyotes actually have two types of fur. One is a downy layer that's nice and soft, kind of like a fleece blanket, keeping them warm. The other layer is called guard hairs, and they're hollow like straws. This layer of fur keeps the heat trapped inside and wrapped around the animal, kind of like the insulation of our houses. Animals don't always need to use their fur for insulation. Beavers do use their fur, but they also store fat in their tails for extra insulation and maybe some energy if they need it. Birds will fluff up their feathers instead of using fur to trap in that warm heat. And all these animals do one more thing, add a layer of oil. They have oil glands in their body that they can use to spread oil on their skin, fur, or feathers. This makes sure that they stay dry during the wet and damp conditions of winter. There's one Illinois mammal that takes an additional step to prep their fur coat. Weasels will change out their summer brown fur to a pure white color. This is a must for camouflage. If they were brown in the fresh snow, they would stick out. But with their pure white, they gain an advantage for their predators and their prey. Finding food is always top priority for these active animals. For predators like coyotes, foxes, and weasels, their prey is still active. Rabbits, voles, and mice will stay underground in their tunnels, but will surface from time to time to find food. Coyotes and foxes can hear the mice underneath the snow. So they do this technique called mousing, where they'll listen and then pounce face first into the snow, hoping to catch some prey. Herbivores may have a harder time finding green vegetation in the winter. So for animals like deer, who normally eat grass, stems, and buds, they'll switch over to eating more high-calorie foods like nuts and berries. Beavers are prepared for this problem too. Before winter, they've collected saplings and have stored them under the mud along the shore near their lodges. The mud keeps the saplings cool and fresh, just like our refrigerators. So when they're hungry, they just hit the fridge that they've been so busy to stock up. How do animals survive the winter? Well, the number one answer I usually hear is hibernate. But out of all the Illinois mammals, really only two are true hibernators, the little brown bat and the groundhog. The rest of the animals that we don't really see often are not sleeping so soundly. 
Hibernation is a type of dormancy where the animal slows down its metabolic activity to conserve energy. This also includes lowering body temperature and heart rate. Both the little brown bat and the groundhog have to start and fall eating and eating to build up their fat deposits to survive. Because this will be their last meal before hibernating and then waking up for spring. Bats will head to caves, hollow trees, and buildings to sleep with a group of bats. And their bodies can withstand temperature swings of up to 120 degrees. Meanwhile, the groundhogs are solo when they hibernate. They dig tunnels underground to burrow, and their body temperature will drop to 36 degrees. Both animals slow everything down to be able to be undisturbed all season long. This includes their heartbeat. So groundhogs only beat five beats per minute, where bats are beating eight beats per minute. To put these rates in a little perspective, an average adult human's heart beats 60 to 100 beats per minute. We talked a lot about our warm-blooded mammals, but what about the amphibians and reptiles? I for sure don't see frogs hopping around this time of year. That's because they're cold-blooded and these animals need the warmer summer temperatures to maintain their body heat. So instead of being active, they take the sleeping approach. The cold-blooded version of hibernation is called brumation. And it's kind of like a combo between hibernating and deep sleeping. Reptiles and amphibians will eat a lot in the fall to store up their body fat, and then they'll sleep without eating another meal. However, they can get up and move around if they need to. Each species may have their own take on brumation. For example, garter snakes like to sleep in a slumber party style, having one space to all huddle together called a hibernaculum, where box turtles do a solo digging adventure, and they'll sleep underground but move from time to time if it gets colder. And water turtles will sleep underneath the water in the mud at the bottom of a pond. Now, this may seem a little cold, but really the water temperature can stay more stable than air temperature. Once the water in a pond freezes over, it actually pushes warmer water in the bottom. This is also where we can find deep sleeping fishes. One amphibian takes brumation to the extreme. Wood frogs are about one to three inches long and have a super power chemical that acts like antifreeze in their bodies. So when they go down to sleep, they stop breathing, their temperature drops, and 70% of water in their body freezes. Then come spring, they thaw out and hop away to continue like normal. Animals like raccoons, skunks, squirrels, and chipmunks aren't super active during winter, but they're also not always sleeping through winter either. These animals are what I like to call deep sleepers. So they're not dormant like our true hibernators, like the little brown bat and groundhog, but instead they go into this torpor state where they sleep for a while, but then can get up to eat and eliminate waste. These animals are similar to those in the active group because they eat a lot in the fall to store up energy, and they also grow thicker hair, but they store food in caches. So during the winter, sometimes you can see dug up holes in the ground, and that could be from an animal digging up a buried nut. During the colder winter days, deep sleepers will stay in their dens to sleep and keep warm. In the case of the squirrel, they build drays, which are big nests in the trees full of leaves and sticks on the outside, but nice and cozy grass on the inside. They'll also open up their drays for many squirrels to kind of snuggle on in so they can sleep together and stay warm together. One group we haven't talked about is insects. And insects will take advantage of a few strategies. For queen bumblebees, they'll mate before going underground and doing a type of hibernation. When they wake up, they're responsible for starting a whole new hive. 
On the flip side, honeybees stay active all winter, but they're inside their hive, keeping the queen warm and themselves while eating up their store food. Many other insects do a strategy called diapause, and this is like taking a pause on their life cycle. For example, praying mantises will overwinter as eggs. Some silk moths will stay as cocoons all winter, and things like beetle pupa will take shelter under the leaf litter. Then come spring, they can press play and continue on through their life cycle, becoming adults. Lastly, if you can't handle the cold temperatures or slow your body way down, then your option is to get out of town, find warmer weather with plenty of food. Migration is a strategy that many birds take advantage of, like hummingbirds, warblers, sandhill cranes, and so many more. They need to fuel up before they leave on their journey, and depending on the bird, they can stop along the way to rest and eat more food. Most birds hit the south, like our southern United States, or even further down, like Central America. But others, like the dark-eyed junco, are coming from way up north and think our area is a much warmer temperature. Birds aren't the only ones to migrate. Green darner dragonflies and painted butterflies embark on a multi-generational journey to make it down south. And one of the most famous insects for migrating is the monarch butterfly. They have one super generation that lives for six months versus their normal six weeks to travel all the way to Mexico, stick around, and then lay new eggs come spring. Winter can be an active time, a sleepy time, or a time to take a road trip if you're an animal in Illinois. All these animals have to start by beefing up and eating all they can to store energy. Some put on heavier winter coats like we do, and others will just take a road trip and leave for warmer weather and plenty of food. I would argue us humans are active during the winter, but I know some of us like to migrate when we can. Either way, make sure you stay active outside this season and keep an eye out for animal signs like tracks, dug up holes, and warm winter dens. The benefits are great when you invest in nature by donating to the Nature Foundation of Will County. You can help protect our precious habitats and restore natural areas back to their native state. Provide educational opportunities to unlock the natural world for present and future generations. Support diversity and inclusion so everyone can experience the magnificence of nature. The Nature Foundation works hand in hand with the Forest Preserve District of Will County to strengthen the commitment to land stewardship, nature education, wellness, cooperation, and sustainability. Donations large and small make a lasting and significant positive impact on the environment. Invest in nature and join our growing community. Support the cause at willcountynature.org. When getting into birding as a hobby, there's usually one bird that sparks the passion. Whether it's a cute chickadee or maybe it's the regal bald eagle. But for me, it was the snowy owl. Snowy owls spend most of their time way up north in Alaska, Canada, or Siberia. But lucky for us, they do spend the winter months down here. Let me begin by telling you my personal story on my search for a snowy owl. I was a new interpreter and I started learning birds by watching the birds at our bird feeders. But my ears were always peaked for reports of snowy owls. It was the winter of 2013-14 and the big birdie news at the time was that it was a snowy owl eruption year. 
It has since been recorded as the largest eruption year to date in the Northeast Great Lakes region. There were owls as far south as Florida and Muta. By the end of it, we had 270 owls reported in Illinois. Surely this was my chance to see one. The odds were in my favor. And one day we did get a report that a snowy owl was spotted in Crete along a road. So this was not a drill. I gathered everyone from the nature center. We piled in a van and we headed to town. We had our binoculars. Eyes were glued on every tree looking for anything white. And then we found something. It was the right size, right color. And we pulled over safely away from traffic to get a closer look. My heart was racing as I took my binoculars and I saw it. I saw the white thing. It ended up being a dreaded plastic bag and no snowy owl. Later that winter, I visited Montrose Harbor to keep searching for the owl. Now I saw amazing waterfall, a lot of new species for my list, but still no owl. I was beginning to dream of this owl and how I was gonna find it. It wasn't until Valentine's Day where I finally saw it. There was a report at Wolf Lake on the border of Illinois and Indiana, and I took one of my friends, and I remember it so clearly. It felt like the Arctic tundra. It was freezing temperatures, there was an advisory wind chill blowing in our face the whole time, and we looked for hours and hours. Still, no owl. Just as we were gonna give up, our friend interpreter Bob Brierton came down, flopped his body scope, and said, there it is, there's no way. So I looked in the scope and I just saw a mound of snow. He's like, no, you have to keep searching like the rest of us. And he looked again, he's like, no, take a look at it. So looked the second time and that mound of snow turned its head and I saw yellow eyes. Woo! Finally, the snowy owl. If you are experiencing the same snowy owl search as I was, or now you're intrigued to see what all the fuss is about, let me share some more insights on snowy owl migration, appearance, and behavior. Let's start with migration and eruption. So every winter, it's totally normal for some snowy owls to migrate this far south. But every three to five years, you'll have an eruption year where hundreds to thousands of owls can come down. Eruptions are signs of a baby boom and are linked to abundance of food in the summer months. Little rodents called lemmings are the main course of snowy owls during the summer. So if there's a boom of lemmings, that means there's a boom of healthy owl chicks that will grow up to migrate. So what should you look for? First off, snowy owls are large. They measure 20 to 27 inches long. That's about the same size as a great horn owl. And they're actually the heaviest owl in North America because they have more feathers to keep them more insulated due to those Arctic temperatures. And this goes for their feet too. Their feet have tons of feathers, make them look like fuzzy slippers compared to other owls. Snowy owls do have white as snow feathers, but there is little brown and black speckles mixed in. Female and immature owls have more of a salt and pepper look because they have black speckles all down their wings and their stomachs, around their head, but just not on their face. Adult males become whiter as they age, so they may keep a few speckles on their wings. Fun fact, one famous owl, Hedwig from Harry Potter, was written in as a female, but if you look closely at the movie, that owl has a little speckles, but white everywhere else. That was a male. Now that you know that they're here and what they look like, when and where do you look? This is a little bit different than our local owls who are nocturnal. Snowy owls are diurnal, meaning that they're active during the day. It's thought that they prefer hunting during the daytime because they have 24 hours of sunlight during their breeding season back in the Arctic. If you think about our local owls, like the barred owl, great horn owl, and eastern screech owl, they're all made to be camouflaged and nestle into the treetops. 
but snowy owls are a little bit different. They like to be on the ground and perch up high, but trees are not gonna be their go-to perch. If you think about where they're from, the Arctic, it's wide and open spaces, and notably treeless. Therefore, they prefer open areas like farm fields and prairies, beach dunes and lake shores, even airports. They can rest on the ground, or when they're hunting, they're perched up high on fence posts, telephone poles, and buildings, anywhere with a good view to look for food. Their diet varies from rodents to rabbits or seabirds and ducks. One owl that's studied by Project Snowstorm has been found to hang out in the Great Lakes, and it uses the buoys as hunting perches. This study has also shown that some owls are home buddies and they don't move about a quarter of a mile, where others like to roam and they'll fly hundreds of miles within a few weeks. Even though now I'm a seasoned birder and I do have a snowy owl on my list, I still keep this species near and dear to my heart. Every winter I try to find a new one, and even though they're rare to see, the thrill of the challenge is worth it. I did see one a few years back on a telephone pole in Romeoville, right along the road. I pulled over and just couldn't believe all these cars zipping by, not noticing this so special bird. If you want to stay updated with sightings, you can look on eBird or join some birding groups on Facebook. But remember, these birds need to be respected. So make sure you observe them quietly and at a far distance and don't use flash photography. Make sure not to lure them in with any calls and don't feed them. And you still have time to keep searching. In Northern Illinois, snowy owls start coming to our area late November, early December, and will stay throughout March. So good luck on your search, and I hope it fuels your birding passion like it did for me. Make this be the year that you take it outside and experience nature at its best in Will County's Forest Preserves. Create lasting memories close to home. Embrace healthy outdoor habits or discover new opportunities for you and your family to spend some quality time together. Find those peaceful moments. Gain a greater appreciation for wildlife and the critical role all creatures play in the ecosystem. Explore a preserve or trail that may be new to you. The views might just surprise and inspire. Seek out more ways to take it outside at reconnectwithnature.org. waterways are full of life. About every animal group is represented, from birds to fish to mammals and more. Now one mammal you may not think that we have here is river otters. River otters are the largest of the weasel family and live a semi-aquatic lifestyle like beavers and muskrats. River otters also have an incredible conservation success story, are built for playful swimming, and are top predators in the ecosystem. In 1989, river otters were listed on the state endangered species list. This was due to habitat loss, hunting, and overharvesting. With only 100 otters left, Illinois initiated a conservation program. Through the program, otters from healthy Louisiana populations were trapped and relocated to southern and central Illinois. Biologists monitored all their movements to see if the program was a success. And it was. River otters were taken off the endangered and the threatened species list in 2004. By 2009, their numbers were estimated to be 11,000 individuals. Now, there are estimated to be 20,000 river otters. They're getting reported more and more through Will County waterways and even further up north in the Chicago River. 
As their name suggests, river otters can be found in rivers and streams as well as lakes. Ideal bodies of water are those that are bordered by forests and wetlands. Even though they spend a lot of time on land, river otters are built for swimming, to hunt, and to travel. When they're young, they're very playful. They can be seen slipping and sliding on the riverbanks and then making huge splashes in the water. But all this playtime is important because it helps them learn their survival skills. River otters can dive 36 feet down below. That's about the same length as a yellow school bus. Once they're under the water, they can hold their breath for eight minutes. And what about water getting up their noses? Well, their noses and ears automatically shut. And how do they see underwater? They have see-through eyelids and long whiskers that help them sense their way in the dark water. Over the course of a year, a male otter can hunt along 40 to 100 linear miles of shoreline. Now, females stay in a little smaller area of 3 to 10 miles of shoreline. River otters are carnivores, and they eat anything they can find in the water, like fish, crayfish, frogs, turtles, snakes, and more. And they're kind of messy eaters. They're known to drag a fish up on land, have the scales spread all over the place, and leave uneaten bits behind. Now this is a good clue to see that you have a river otter active in your area. Next time you're by a river, make sure to keep an eye out for river otters. And it's a really good sign if you see one. They're considered indicator species, which means that they won't live in an area that's too polluted. So even though it's super exciting to see one, it's even more exciting to know that our habitat is healthy enough to support its lifestyle. I hope you learned something new to start off the new year. Maybe it was that not every animal hibernates, or that snowy owls call our area a winter vacation, or maybe even that we have river otters in Illinois. Now take your knowledge to the next level by mapping out your adventure at reconnectwithnature.org to find the best places to stay active this winter. I hope to see you joining me on the lookout for snowies, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.